Hi guys, um, as we continue talking about regulating eukaryotic genes, uh, we're going to focus this time on, on RNA and I hope this video is not as long as the last one was. I'm sorry how long that, that was longer than I intended it to be. Anyway, RNA is getting a lot of, um, press nowadays because the, the, uh, coronavirus uh, vaccines that are available currently in the United States are RNA viruses, RNA vaccines. And so um, RNA, the thing that you may not realize about RNA, we think about RNA as being the, the product of transcription and it's used for uh, translation, but RNA actually uh, can be used lot for lots of different things. Um, there are RNA enzymes, believe it or not, they're called ribozymes and, um, and lots of other, lots of other things. And so we're going to talk today about some of the ways that RNA can be used to regulate genes. So, big thing is that you have a number of RNAs called non-coding or NC RNAs, and they do lots of different things in controlling gene expression in different kinds of cells at different times. So, uh, notice it says here only a small fraction of DNA actually encodes proteins, and a very small fraction of the non-protein coding DNA has genes for RNAs like ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, of course, okay, but then there's other non-coding RNAs that are used for lots of different kinds of things, and uh, including regulating gene expression. So, a uh, big thing is that we have uh, several different kinds we're going to talk about. The first kind is microRNAs, or miRNAs. These are single-stranded RNA molecules that can bind to complementary mRNA sequences, and they can also degrade the messenger RNA or block its translation. And that's an important thing if you don't want that protein to be made. Okay. And so, um, and it's useful for lots of different, lots of different purposes in the cells. And so if the microRNA, uh, binds to the, um, the target mRNA, then that can cause the target mRNA to be degraded or, uh, it can block the translation. Depends on, whether the bases are completely complementary or just partially complementary. So if you have, if the bases are completely complementary, then it's going to degrade that messenger RNA. If it's only partially complementary, as you see in this one compared to this one, uh, then it's going to block the translation and uh, not necessarily break down that RNA, but it's going to block its translation at that particular time. Another class of small RNAs are called small interfering RNAs or siRNAs. And they're similar to the, the microRNAs, but they're uh, different precursors, of course. And the big thing is that, that this, this is something called RNA interference, which we'll talk about more when we talk about um, development and embryology a little bit in the, in the next part of this unit. Okay, we'll talk about um, uh, embryonic development later on. And so um, siRNAs can also um, form certain kinds of molecules. They can actually, they can actually um, help make functional proteins functional. Um, so formation of heterochromatin at the centromeres of the chromosomes, that's an important thing there. It can also uh, make chromatin modify or enact, interact with chromatin modifying enzymes and that can condense their centromeres and, um, and you know, cause lots of different things in the DNA to, to either prevent transcription or allow it. Um, there are some others called peewee associated RNAs that induce the formation of heterochromatin, which is the, which is the, um, the, uh, tightly wound chromatin. And that's going to uh, block the expression of various DNA elements in the genome. These are called transposons. Transposons are actually sometimes called jumping genes. They're genes that can actually move from place to place, believe it or not. Anyway, the, the non-coding uh, RNAs makes this whole process, of course, a whole lot more complicated. Um, we're just learn some of this stuff we're still learn learning about in, in the recent past, and we'll continue to learn about it in the future because it's diff very different. This is showing um, using various kinds of RNA to with uh, with fluorescent tags to show origin of certain kinds of cells in a developing embryo, and we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of stuff coming up pretty soon. Um, you can monitor. That's what that picture goes with. You can monitor the expression of certain genes by putting tags on the messenger RNAs or on the on the other kinds of RNAs that are used uh, to regulate the gene expression. And so if you, you can identify the messenger RNA, then you can hopefully identify the protein that's being made. If you think back to the stickleback video, that's what they did with the stickleback video. They put a fluorescent tag or a, a, a some kind of a tag on the messenger RNA to show where those genes are being expressed. Um, 
where the where the RNA was being made in the different parts of the of the fish embryos that we that we looked at there. So nucleic acid hybridization is the process that's used for this, and basically you pair the nucleic acid to its complementary sequence, and then you've got a short single-stranded um, molecule, either DNA or RNA, that's called a probe, and it's labeled with a fluorescent tag, and that lets you see where it is. This lets us see where the mRNA is in the in the organism in situ and that's called this is called in situ hybridization and again when you think back to the stickleback video that's what they were showing when they showed the location of the of how those genes were activated in the different parts of the fish embryo um, here's kind of how it works okay you've got uh, this gene this is a, a, in fruit flies talking about wingless wingless or engrailed I'm not really sure what both of those things are in the fruit, fruit fly, but there are various genes that they can follow there. And so you can put, you basically, you put a different color fluorescent tag on different ones that you're, that you're looking for the mRNAs that express those particular genes. And then when you inject that into the embryo, then it'll show different places. Another thing that you can use for uh, looking at messenger RNAs is called reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, okay, RT-PCR. And this takes this, the messenger RNAs and turns them into double-stranded DNAs with corresponding sequences. And that's uh, very useful for a lot of different purposes uh, when you're looking at different RNAs. So here we have a test tube containing the, uh, the reverse transcriptase and the messenger RNA. And there's our messenger RNAs in the cytoplasm. We'll take, put those in there. And then we're going to make the first DNA strand with the reverse transcriptase uh, enzyme that you find in various kinds of in, uh, um, viruses and things like that. And then uh, the messenger RNA would be degraded, and then you can make complementary DNA or cDNA. That's the second the second strand, and this is cDNA that is that has the complete coding sequence without introns. This is very useful for genetic engineering, which we're getting ready to talk about pretty soon. And uh, so, when we talk about putting in like putting genes in different organisms, for instance, a lot of times we use uh, bacteria to, to do that process, or we'll put the genes, human genes or some other kind of animal genes, into bacteria to have them make those proteins for those organisms. Um, and again, the Bacteria can't process the RNA the same way that the um, eukaryotic uh, nuclei do. They don't. The bacteria don't have introns, and so they don't need to be removed. And so they need just the straight, the straight information. And so complementary DNA is a way that we can. That's what we would put into a bacterium to have a bacterium make, for instance, uh, insulin or some uh, human growth hormone or some other kind of uh, eukaryotic protein. RT-PCR uses reverse transcriptase, okay, and reverse transcriptase uh, is very useful in a lot of biotechnology um, uh, um, applications, all right, and then we can use PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to make many copies of it using primers that are specific to that sequence. We can make lots and lots of copies of it to use for different things. So here's our, our cDNA synthesis, uh, and then we can make our cDNAs. Like we saw before, we can make our cDNA like in, like in the process we saw before, and then we can amplify that with PCR. And then that lets us see the amount of the messenger RNA that's made in different stages of the embryo. Um, a lot of times what we're looking at is how genes work together to maintain a functioning organism because you have a lot of different things that are involved. And so you use a systems approach to, to learn about this to identify how the gene expression across the entire genome uh, maintains that organism or produces that organism. This, uh, these are called genome-wide expression studies, and we can use things like microarrays to um, to show where those things are. Um, messenger RNAs from these different cells are isolated and made into cDNAs that are labeled with fluorescent molecules and then they can be put in a, in a chip, what we call an, a DNA chip, and look at those different fluorescent tags and see where those genes are expressed. Um, for instance, here's an example. So the genes uh, that are red are expressed in the first tissue there. The genes in the green wells are expressed in the second tissue. The yellow wells are in, are in both of them. And then the black wells are not expressed in either one of the tissues that we're looking at in this particular um, assay. Um, so an alternative to that 
is to sequence the cDNA samples from different tissues or stages to see where the genes are expressed. This is called RNA sequencing, and it's becoming more widespread. Of course, as this cost of sequencing decreases, sequencing is going down and down and down in cost. And so being able to study genes that are expressed together might help us understand better um, a different kinds of diseases or new diagnostic tests or things like that. Uh, we're going to stop now talking about this. This probably, this part, the cDNA stuff probably will not be on the test. Uh, this is, but it kind of helps lead us from the gene expression into learning about the biotechnology topics that we're going to get into in the next part of this unit. So I'm going to end here and that's it for today.